Hey, I'm Kerry Gashuro, and welcome to Let It Rip. We're coming to you from the CUNY TV studios in the shadow of the Empire State Building in New York City. Congressman Kevin McCarthy became the first House Speaker in U.S. history to be ousted in an extraordinary showdown with a contingent of eight hard right conservatives, leaving the House of Representatives and its Republican leadership in chaos. McCarthy's removal was initiated by none other than the MAGA-loving, conspiracy-toting Florida Congressman Matt Gates. Gates, who was once under investigation by the Justice Department for sex trafficking, expressed dissatisfaction with McCarthy for working with Democrats to pass two bills, one to avert a government shutdown and the other to prevent the country from defaulting on its debts. The removal was not surprising given the fact that it took 15 rounds of voting for McCarthy to become House Speaker and that lengthy and chaotic process was a reflection of an ongoing division within the Republican Party. In fact, McCarthy had to acquiesce to new rules proposed by his Republican colleagues, one of which indicated that a single Republican could initiate a motion to vacate the chair, a vote that would effectively topple a sitting speaker. And that is exactly what happened. Here to help us discuss the current chaos in Congress is New York City Council Member Charles Barron, former New York Assembly Member Adam Clayton Powell IV, and Alexandra Cortese, a student at CUNY and the managing editor of The Sentinel at John Jay College. I'm Carol Gashiro, and this is Let It Rip. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Charles, I'll come mm -hmm. to you. What's your take on what's going on with the, um, the House of Representatives in terms of the Republicans? I'd like to hear from well, you know, this is consistent with what has been happening in this country. Remember, this is a country that gave Sarah Palin 55 million votes who was to the right. This is a country that gave Donald Trump nearly 75 million votes, which was moving to the right. And then they have this Freedom Caucus that came into power in 2015. And one of the speaking candidates, Jordan, he was the chair of the first caucus, and now it's Perry. So you see in the country shifting far right, and even within the Dem Republican Party, it's shifting far right. Of course, I'm a black radical. I think we need to have a new system altogether. But on this Republican question, it is really scary that some of the characters that are in this Freedom Caucus that now has the balance of power is a very, very frightening proposition for Americans. What's your take on what's going on with the, um, the House of Representatives in terms of the Republicans? Well, you know, it's a mess, Republicans or Democrats. I mean, uh, keep it in perspective, the first time in history that a speaker was voted out. Mm -hmm. It's never happened before. So this is obviously uncharted waters. I mean, it took Kevin McCarthy 15 votes, let's not forget, just to become speaker. And uh, now he's the first speaker to be ousted. It's, it's just chaos. Mm -hmm. both, both of them got to get it together. Alexandra, what's your take on everything that's been going on so far? As a student journalist, students are mad at the Republican Party. And being that John Jay prides itself on its community, that's exactly the opposite of what we're seeing in Congress. And students are fearful. But what do you say in terms of the fact that um, it's members of the Freedom Caucus that actually have the balance of power now? So it almost blurs the line of this idea that you have moderate Republicans and all that. Well, you know, in all parties, you have uh, left, right, center, moderate, center, conservative. So when you look at blue dog Democrats who are close to uh, Republicans, this is a frightening proposition because now these are the same people who were with the Tea Party. These are Tea Party people. These are folk who don't want no kind of civil rights. These are folk who don't want to make sure that the WIC program is not funded, pro social programs are, are cut. This is a, a left, a right-wing conservative party that wants the military budget bloated and wants to go all across the world and continue imperialistic policies. So we got to really look at, the people need to rise up and really look at this and say that if they can have a guy like McCarthy, who's right-wing, conservative, and horrible, look moderate compared to these others, that's a bad proposition. That's not a good proposition. Yeah, I hear you. And Alexander, you said um, something important. You said that students are mad at Republicans. Yeah. What are some of the things that they're dis disappointed about? They're like, disappointed that this can happen in our Congress. We're supposed to be a united country, and that's exactly the opposite of what we're seeing. Students are going to be impacted if in another month or so 
this party can't reach a resolution. It's going to affect uh, food assistance programs that a tremendous amount of CUNY students rely on. Also, Republicans have been resistant to, uh, to helping uh, student debt, you know, student loans. I mean, they've been resistant to everything, uh, raising minimum wage, you know, they've been resistant to civil rights, as uh, uh, Charles pointed out. I mean, it's just, and we're dealing with a few of them, which are like the worst of the worst. We're dealing with like a dozen or so out of 435 members of Congress, a dozen to the far right, and they're controlling the agenda, which is going to be horrible. But should any of this surprise us, given the fact that no. we had the Tea Party coming yeah. in, as uh, Charles pointed out? Um, and what do you think that indicates going forward? No, nah, it's no surprise. Unfortunately, over the last 30 years, we started with New Gingrich, the contract with America, mm -hmm. and then the Tea Party, and now the Freedom Caucus, the Freedom Caucus of all names. It's just getting worse, man. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about how things have been working out in the long run, what does it say about the American public that is willing to vote for some of these hard right conservatives? It says a lot, right, about some people and, and how they operate and how they think in their minds, in their heads, because these people wouldn't be uh, uh, in office and, 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 and doing all these horrible things unless they had a base mm -hmm. to work with. And it's unfortunate that we, we split as a country totally between, uh, you know, people who have a progressive agenda, they're down for, you know, worker rights and women rights and civil rights, uh, a black Latino, and people who just don't care, who just only want rights for people who look like them, white, you know, um, anyway, it's sad. Alexandra, you know, from the students that, uh, that uh, your colleagues in, uh, in college, do any of them, have any of them ever supported uh, any of the Republican candidates, uh, whether it's in New York City or just nationally? So in my classes, there have been far-right conservatives, and um, from that perspective, people just see, you know, they want to uprise against our current policy and are against, as, um, as you mentioned before, infringing upon civil rights. Um, and also students are growing increasingly apathetic to vote. They don't even see that a solution can come from this current system because it's just putting people through further turmoil. Okay. And Charles, when we think about the two-party system, a lot of folks are saying it's not working. What's your take on that? Well, the two-party system has failed in America. This government is not functioning. You know, right now they're trying to pass 12 appropriation bills so that they can um, keep the government operating. One, uh, got one reporter asked me, how do you feel about the government shutdown? I said, it's been <laughs> shut down for black people and brown people, it never opened up. Mm -hmm. But if it's bad for us, you know, they say when America catches a cold, we catch cancer and we mm -hmm. die. It is really, a, really an alarming situation, but my optimism is the people of America. I think people are gonna rise up when they see more of this denial of the right for freedom of speech, the right to have a decent home, the right to have food on your plate and a shelter over your head and clothes on your back. These are fundamental human rights that these right-wing conservatives and some extent to those in the Democratic mm -hmm. Party. So it's happening mm -hmm. in both parties, but these guys are taking it to a fascist level, mm -hmm. a frightening fascist level where we can really see a tremendous amount of our human rights being denied. Adam, I want to come back to you in terms of what, how should the Democrats then navigate uh, this sort of white nationalism coming out of the Republican Party? Well, you know, it's hard because um, in, some, in some ways they're both uh, at fault. I mean, we can go back to the Dixiecrats of the South. I mean, uh, the fact that, you know, the wealth gap, how the rich are getting richer and, and the poor struggling to survive, that's happened under both Republicans and Democrats. I mean, 50 years ago, uh, you know, in a lot of households, you only have one uh, person working, and that one job could, you know, pay the rent, uh, uh, get the kids through school, maybe send them to college, but have a vacation every now and then. Nowadays, both uh, uh, husband and wife are working, sometimes two jobs each, and they're still struggling to pay the rent. I mean, you can see it in statistics. Uh, used to be a, a CEO to a worker was like, uh, I think, 39 to 1. Right. Now it's like 400 to one, and CEOs are making 400, 400 times more than, you know, the wealth gap is getting out of control. That's both Republicans and Democrats. Alexandra, I want to come to you for the final point. Um, what's your take on the administration's failure to pass student debt relief and what that means within a fractured um, 
House of Representatives. Yeah, um, students are struggling to even get to school. I know personally, it's $60 a week to get back and forth from Staten Island to Manhattan. Students bring lunch all day because they can't afford a cup of coffee. It really says a lot about how, fra how the fractured system is impacting people's lives on such a personal level. Student debt relief is out of control. I know many of my peers have, have accrued about $49,000 in debt so far. It is un it's unfeasible if you want to mobilize a new system and get those younger voices heard. Okay. And what would be the ideal outcome when it comes to student debt? Are folks okay with paying uh, lower student debt as based on their uh, income or is it complete debt forgiveness? A lot of students want complete debt forgiveness. Great discussion, but we'll have to end it there. Uh, let's take a short break and when we come back, We'll tackle the growing concerns that Republicans are pushing the Biden administration further to the right on immigration and environmental policies. I'm Kerry Gashuro, and this is Let It Rip. Hey, I'm Kerry Gashuro, and welcome back to Let It Rip. Now, during his presidential campaign, President Joe Biden made it clear that he would not build on Donald Trump's attempts to construct a border wall. There will not be another foot of wall constructed on my administration. Yet in a stunning reversal, the Biden administration announced that it would waive environmental regulations to allow the construction of up to 20 additional miles of border wall in Texas. The Biden administration also reversed course on its campaign pledge to stop new oil and gas drilling on public lands and federal waters. Some believe Biden's reversal on his campaign pledge to end oil drilling is bound to affect his re-election campaign. Others suggest that President Biden is pivoting further to the right, as noted by CUNY Brooklyn College professor Mustafa Bayoumi in his recent article titled, Why is Joe Biden campaigning for Trump? Panel, let's get back to it. I want to st start with you, <laughs> <laughs> Charles. Um, what's your take on Biden reversing some of his pledges? You know, they think it's a big reversal for him, and it is, but that's where he always was. He always was more conservative. Remember, Biden went way back, didn't want to support busing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and all of that. So mm -hmm. he has been very, very concerned. Uh, also, he has uh, executive orders that he has the power to implement. Let's take the question of reparations. Hey, black people, I know who got me in. I got your back. Remember those famous words? Mm -hmm. Well, he's been stabbing us in the backs because right now he can have a presidential commission on reparations. We don't have to go through Congress. Uh, he refuses to do that. His student debt service is not happening. It's in court. Uh, his environmental reversals. And internationally, looking at his support of Israel for over the decades, and so did Obama and the lopsided support. So him internationally and domestically, he has been a total failure and did not live up to his campaign promises at all, particularly for black and brown people. Adam, how about the immigration stuff? Well, Do, see, this is the we... thing. I mean, there's nothing to add after Charles speaks. <laughs> That's the problem speaking after this brother. I associate myself with all of what he said. That's why I'm but, coming to the immigration question. Yeah. You know, should we, surprise, should we be surprised that he's decided to build on Trump's... Um, no, we shouldn't be surprised. Program. I mean, Biden has several speeds, depending on the uh, uh, circumstances and the uh, political, you know, winds are blowing. And one of the speeds is reverse. I mean, he needs to park, you know, certain way, and he'll just hit that reverse. Mm -hmm. Like Charles alluded to, even going back to, uh, you know, the 70s uh, with the uh, issue of buzzing and uh, many other issues. So, you mm -hmm. know, you can never know where Biden is going to land tomorrow. But so what would... Not a, it doesn't seem to be a straight shooter. <laughs> right, Maybe exactly. he makes a good politician, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But not a straight but shooter. But some of the... Some of the other conversations mm -hmm. is that, you know, you have this migrant crisis where folks are coming in from Mexico, Venezuela. Yes. How, how would he be, well, how should he be able to handle that? It's tough, man. It's tough because this country has always been welcoming, you know, open arms to uh, uh, immigration. And, and we got to find rooms for some of these people. There are many jobs here that uh, they could do. There are many jobs here that many Americans will not do that we need, you know, certain immigration people to come in and do their thing. And when they come, by the way, seeking asylum, they're not illegals. I just want to make that very clear. Mm -hmm. This country, you know, has that very clear law that you can come here legally, seek asylum, and, you know, if, if it's not granted, then you got to go back. But if it's granted, you, everything was legal. So, you know, it's tough. We, we got we to find a true balance, and that's not an easy thing. Okay. 
Alexandra, coming back to you, what do you think about the migrant crisis that's happening in New York City? And what would you suggest would be some of the better ways to handle it? Uh, students are seeing this on our doorsteps, you know. Um, John Jay, a bunch of migrants are lined up uh, within the vicinity on 42nd Street. Students are growing rapidly concerned for these people and what this means for the future. Aspiring politicians are even hesitant about going that career route because they don't think the answer is in politics. They think the answer is in mobilization. Right. So what would be some of the remedies that you would suggest if Adams was to say, come to you and say, hey, what are some of the recommendations you would have? There needs to be legislation passed for what to do with these people. They need adequate housing. They need adequate health care access. Okay, great. Uh, Charles, I know you've been a critic of the um, Adams administration, particularly on how it's handling the migrant crisis. Mm -hmm. what are, what, what's your take on it? Well, you know, first I would start with Biden. Why are people fleeing Nicaragua? They're not fleeing Nicaragua because of socialism. It is because of imperialism. Why are they fleeing all of these countries, Mexico, um, all of the countries that are coming to Haiti. Look what the United States has done in Haiti. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Most of these folk don't want to come here. They'd rather stay in their beautiful countries mm -hmm. with the sunshine and all of the greenery and fruits and all of that. And that they flee in because of American imperialism. So he first has to start there. So once they come, we should welcome them and do two things. Those that are in shelters now, See, we can't neglect that and just focus on the migration or the immigrants. Get them out of shelters into permanent housing. We did it in East New York. Every developer that came to East New York, I said, you have to have 10, 15, 20 percent for the homeless. We got over 300 families out of homeless shelters into permanent housing. Excellent. Do that first and then have the migrants take that. And then what about Hulko? Right. Upstate. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want them <laughs> fight folk upstate. Yep. Let me They're go. a little racist. Yep. Get Let me go back to, give to it you, up. Um, yeah. And cheaper, by the way, and right. cheaper. Because right now we're paying like up to $380 for, for, for a night at a hotel. You do the math, that's over 10000 a month. Mm -hmm. So for a couple of thousand, we can set these people up in a good apartment where they can get up on their feet. Right. But you also supported Eric Adams. Uh, what's yes. your take on this particular issue? And is that something that you've critiqued him on? Well, I mean, the fact is uh, there are certain things he can do better, for sure. Um, again, we got to stop putting them in $10,000 a month hotels. We got to start putting them in, in regular housing, 2000 2500 Even if we have to pay for it, it's a whole lot less than $10,000 a month. I don't agree with that. There are a lot of sites and places that he could have opened up for migrants, for uh, homeless, so to speak. But he's doing the right thing when it comes to New York State has to be helpful with this. I mean, first of all, this should not be a New York City issue coming from Texas, coming from, uh, you know, immigration uh, issues that we have in this country. They should not land in New York City because we have that, you know, uh, a welcoming thing about the, uh, the, uh, the court um, mandate. Right. The Callahan uh, court decree whereby everybody who comes here homeless, no matter where they come from, we got to find them a bed by 4 in the morning. If you get here by 10 at night, you got to find a bed by 4 in the morning, a certain size bed a certain feet from the other bits. I mean, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. He's doing best he can, but we cannot be the shelter for, you know, everybody coming to us. I the mean, that's, that's, that's understandable, yeah, but yeah. If, if you made the, the argument sure. earlier that uh, migrants coming in have to apply for asylum, yes. how then can you now pivot and say, well, we can't really do it all? You know, I think it has to be one or the well, other. Well, we can't do it all in New York City. Again, we got to spread, you know, the, the migrants all over New York State. There are many communities that, you know, need them and should take them. Okay. And all over the, you know, various states. I mean, this should not be a New York City issue, which, again, has become over the last year and a half. It's okay. a new phenomenon. Um, I'm going to shift gears for, for a minute. I want to speak about the environment. Um, Alexandra, I want to come to you. What's your take on how some of the things that Joe Biden has done in terms of reversing his policies, whether it's gas and oil drink, uh, drilling in the Gulf of Mexico? Mm -hmm. Do folks, are folks experiencing some of the climate concerns that, um, you know, have been going on? Yes, yeah, students are really worried about the weather every single day. You're undoing years of environmental work that, you know, students, pioneers and trailblazers have aided to. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Charles, I'll come mm -hmm. to you. So one of the arguments that the uh, oil industry is making is that America is one of the largest producers of oil and that by stopping oil drilling, you're essentially now making it more difficult for us to be able to produce oil. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, not at all. See, if you move to the God-given environmental, inexpensive, clean, why can't we do solar panels, solar energy? Why can't we do hydro energy, water? Why can't we do wind turbines? And you know what's a big market of some powerful energy? Geothermal energy, mm. the energy from the earth. Mm. There is power, the power. I know some countries like Iceland moved away from coal, moved away from um, oil, and went into geothermal. Mm. Now they have an excessive uh, source of energy, and they can actually send it out to the world. But uh, some people mm. are saying that we're way, that would take way too long. No, it wouldn't, uh -huh. because... Um, the sun is right here. We, we, we just wait for the sun to come out. Mm -hmm. And you can do solar. There's water all over the place. You better hurry up and do water because it's going to be a, a slight commodity in the future because water is going to be more valuable than oil, than anything else, the way the climate change is going and drying up things. So, okay. And then geothermal, you just need to develop the technology. It's in the earth. The earth is inexhaustible. Okay. The air, wind is inexhaustible. <laughs> sun. <laughs> It's true. I mean, we, we are, you know, suffering from a global warming. Uh, I don't I never understood how the weather could be political, but somehow Republicans don't want to believe in it. I mean, mm. it's science. It's out there. Right. You, you know, things are melting. The uh, North Pole, South Pole, the glaciers. But it doesn't seem. And the water levels are rising. Yeah, but it doesn't Something seem like that some Republicans year. or even some sections of the Democratic Party understand Right, that. but most Republicans, right. unfortunately. How, yeah, how do you get folks to be on the same wagon so that we can go in the same direction? Man, I don't know. If you maybe you take them to a couple of the beaches that have been wiped out over the last 10 years. I can show you some beaches in Puerto Rico that are no longer there. Okay. Whether you had a beach with sand and now the water just hits oh, the uh, right. cement wall. Mm -hmm. It's happening in Florida. Right. And okay. it's going to continue to happen. An inch per year may not sound like a lot, but that's a foot <laughs> every 10 yes, years. I got gotcha. yes, you. All right, great discussion. All but right. again, we'll have to end it there. I want to thank our guests, Councilmember Charles Barron, Adam Clayton Powell IV, and Alexandra Cortese. When we come back, we'll take a look at the current Israel-Palestinian conflict. I'm Kiro Gashuro, and this is Let It Rip. Welcome back to Let It Rip. I'm Kiro Gashuro. We end with the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Israel declared an all-out offensive on Gaza after Hamas launched a devastating attack on Israeli civilians. Hamas abducted over 200 people and killed over 1,400 Israeli civilians, many of whom were attending an outdoor concert. In response, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, ordered a full siege of Gaza, pounding the region with precision airstrikes. The death toll continues to climb with Palestinians killed. That disproportionate response reflects Israeli's defense minister, Yoav Gallant's use of genocidal language when he said, and I quote, we're fighting human animals and we act accordingly. In response, Lynn Hastings, the UN humanitarian coordinator for the occupied Palestinian territory, said, and I quote, they have said they want to destroy Hamas, but their current trajectory is going to destroy Gaza. Other senior UN relief officials have called for an immediate ceasefire and the immediate unconditional access to Gaza to provide life-saving aid. In the United States, President Joe Biden stood in solidarity with Israel and pledged additional military assistance. Biden also traveled to Israel in an attempt to address the ongoing siege in Gaza. Now, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party has also called for an immediate ceasefire. Support rallies have taken place across New York City amid this conflict. We can't overlook the thousands of people who recently marched in New York City to support Palestinians and raise awareness of this crisis that is happening in Gaza. Organizations such as the Jewish Voices for Peace have been one of the leading groups spearheading these efforts. A 2022 UN report concluded that continued occupation, as well as discrimination against Palestinians, remain the key causes of ongoing instability and conflict. We know that peace in that region is possible if it is rooted in freedom, self-determination, equality, and dignity for everyone. I'm Kei Rugashiro, and this is Let It Rip.